According to Stafford, our flight was to take the first lunar module to the moon. We would take the lunar module, go down to within about 10 miles above the moon, 9 miles above the mountains, radar map, photo map, pick out the first landing site, do the first rendezvous around the moon, pick out some future landing sites, and come home. Apollo 10 was to adhere as closely as possible to the plans for Apollo 11, including its trajectory to and from lunar orbit, the timeline of events during the mission, and even the angle of the sun at ALS-2. ALS-1, given that number because it was the furthest to the east of the candidate sites, a, uh, and also located in the Sea of Tranquility, had been extensively photographed by Apollo 8 astronauts. At the suggestion of scientist astronaut Harrison Schmidt, the launch of Apollo 10 had been postponed a day so ALS-2 could be photographed under proper conditions. ALS-2 was chosen as the lunar landing site since it was relatively smooth, of scientific interest, and ALS-1 was deemed too far to the east. Thus, when Apollo 10's launch date was announced on January 10, 1969, it was shifted from its placeholder date of May 1 to May 17, rather than to May 16. Another deviation from the plans for Apollo 11 was that Apollo 10 was to spend an additional day in lunar orbit once the CSM and LM rendezvoused. This was to allow time for additional testing of the LM systems, as well as for photography of possible future Apollo landing sites. The Apollo 10 astronauts undertook five hours of formal training for each hour of the mission's eight-day duration. This was in addition to the normal mission preparations such as technical briefings, pilot meetings and study. They visited Cambridge, Massachusetts for briefings on the Apollo guidance computer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Instrumentation Laboratory. While Apollo 10 was meant to follow the procedures of a lunar landing mission to the point of powered descent, Apollo 10's LM was not capable of a landing and return to lunar orbit. The ascent stage was loaded with the amount of fuel and oxidizer it would have had remaining if it had lifted off from the surface and reached the altitude at which the Apollo 10 ascent stage fired. This was only about half the total amount required for lift-off and rendezvous with the CSM. The mission-loaded LM weighed 13,941 kilograms, compared to 15,095 kilograms for the Apollo 11 LM which made the first landing. The software necessary to guide the LM to a landing was not available at the time of Apollo 10. Craig Nelson wrote in his book Rocketman that NASA took special precaution to ensure Stafford and Cernan would not attempt to make the first landing. The service module and command module arrived on November 24 and were mated two days later. Portions of the Saturn V launch vehicle arrived during November and December 1968, and the complete launch vehicle was erected in the vehicle assembly building on December 30. After being tested in an altitude chamber, the CSM was placed atop the launch vehicle on February 6, 1969. The completed space vehicle was rolled out to launch Complex 39B on March 11, 1969 The fact that it had been assembled in the VAB's High Bay 2 required the crawler to exit the rear of the VAB before looping around the building and joining the main crawlerway, proceeding to the launch pad. This rollout, using Mobile Launch Platform 3, happened eight days after the launch of Apollo 9, while that mission was still in orbit. The launch vehicle for Apollo 10 was a Saturn V, designated as 505, the fifth flight-ready Saturn V to be launched and the third to take astronauts to orbit. The Saturn V differed from that used on Apollo 9 in having a lower dry weight in its first two stages, with a significant reduction to the interstage joining them. Although the SIVB third stage was slightly heavier, all three stages could carry a greater weight of propellant, and the S2 second stage generated more thrust than that of Apollo 9. The Apollo spacecraft for the Apollo 10 mission was composed of Command Module 106, Service Module 106, Lunar Module 4, a spacecraft lunar module adapter, numbered as SLA-13A, and a launch escape system. The SLA was a mating structure joining the instrument unit on the SIVB stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle and the CSM, and acted as a housing for the LM, while the launch escape system contained rockets to propel the CM to safety if there was an aborted launch. At about 133.8 metric tons, Apollo 10 would be the heaviest spacecraft to reach orbit to that point. Apollo 10 launched from KSC on May 18, 1969, at 12 hours 49 minutes and 0 seconds Eastern Daylight Saving Time, at the very start of a 4.5-hour launch window. The launch window was timed to secure optimal lighting conditions at Apollo Landing Site 2 at the time of the LM's closest approach to the site days later. The launch followed a countdown that had begun at 21 hours 0 minutes and 0 seconds Eastern Daylight Saving Time on May 16. 
Apollo 10 launched from Pad 39B and was the only flight to launch from that pad during the Apollo program, and it was also the only flight to be controlled from Firing Room 3 there. Pad 39B was used because preparations for Apollo 11 had already begun at Pad 39A. Issues that arose during the countdown were dealt with during the built-in holds, and did not delay the mission. On the day prior to launch Cernan had been stopped for speeding while returning from a final visit with his wife and child. Lacking identification and under orders to tell no one who he was, Cernan later attested in his autobiography that he had feared being arrested. Launch pad leader Gunther Wendt, who had pulled over nearby after recognizing Cernan, explained the situation to the police officer, who then released Cernan despite the officer's skepticism that Cernan was an astronaut. The crew experienced a somewhat rough ride on the way to orbit due to pogo oscillations, however, approximately 12 minutes after liftoff, the spacecraft successfully entered a low Earth orbit with a high point of 185.79 km and a low point of 184.66 km. All appeared to be normal during the system's review period in Earth orbit, and the crew restarted the SIVB third stage to achieve trans-lunar injection and send them towards the Moon. The vehicle shook again while executing the TLI burn, causing Cernan to be concerned that they might have to abort. Young then performed the transposition, docking, and extraction maneuver, separating the CSM from the SIVB stage, turning around, and docking its nose to the top of the lunar module, before separating from the SIVB. Apollo 10 was the first mission to carry a color television camera inside the spacecraft, and mission controllers in Houston watched as Young performed the maneuver. One problem that was encountered was that the mylar cover of the CM's hatch had pulled loose, spilling quantities of fiberglass insulation into the tunnel, and then into both the CM and LM. The SIVB was fired by ground command and sent into solar orbit with a period of 344.88 days. In June 1969, the crew would accept a special Emmy Award on behalf of the first four Apollo crews for their television broadcasts from space. Eight into the mission and lasted 7.1 seconds. This aligned Apollo 10 with the trajectory Apollo 11 was expected to take. Blythe, California, but that Apollo 11 could face rougher terrain downrange if it approached off-target. Based upon Apollo 10's observations from relatively low altitude, NASA mission planners became comfortable enough with ALS-2 to confirm it as the target site for Apollo 11. The next action was to prepare to separate the LM ascent stage from the descent stage, to jettison the descent stage and fire the ascent propulsion system to return the ascent stage towards the CSM. As Stafford and Cernan prepared to do so, the LM began to gyrate out of control. Alarmed, Cernan exclaimed into the hot mic being broadcast live, son of a bitch. Which, combined with other language used by the crew during the mission, generated some complaints back on Earth. Stafford discarded the descent stage about five seconds after the tumbling began and fought to regain control manually, suspecting that there might have been an open thruster, or a thruster stuck firing, and did so in time to be able to orient the spacecraft properly to send Snoopy to rejoin Charlie Brown. The problem was traced to a switch controlling the mode of the abort guidance system, it was to be moved as part of the procedure, but each of the crew members switched it, thus returning it to the original position. Had they fired Snoopy in the wrong direction, they might have missed the rendezvous with Charlie Brown or crashed into the moon at high speed. Once Stafford had regained control of the LM ascent stage, which took about 8 seconds, the pair fired the ascent engine at the lowest point of the LM's orbit, mimicking the orbital insertion maneuver after launch from the lunar surface in a later landing mission. Snoopy coasted on that trajectory for about an hour before firing the engine once more to further fine-tune its approach to Charlie Brown. Snoopy successfully rendezvoused with and re-docked with Charlie Brown at 106, 2202, just under 8 hours after undocking.